Coog's house. We've got a lot of basketball things we got to get into today, including is the future of college sports going to cost us the past? You are locked on Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the podcast all about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach Parker Aintworth. And whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater who came to step by, thank you for making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. If you want to join in the conversation but don't know what to say, tell us in the comments down below or wherever you found this podcast what goes in your breakfast taco. I'm not going to judge you. Whatever you want to put in there. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. More on that later. We got a bunch of stuff to get into regarding basketball, college basketball, and the Cougs. Uh, I want to talk some about a trend I was actually kind of putting together about the Houston Cougars and some youth uh, involved with the Cougs. That'll make more sense later. I'm still workshopping at some, but I think. I'm ready to talk about something I think is worth mentioning. Uh, Big-time recruit on campus over the weekend for the Houston Cougar basketball program. Uh, That kind of jumpstarts a lot of today's show in the second segment. But first and foremost, the news of the day in college basketball somewhat tangentially ties to Houston in some ways and directly applies to Houston and others. We're talking about the 1983 National Championship game, and I don't want to relive the game. I don't want to play the clip. I, I don't actually have rights to the clip, and I wouldn't play if I did. But that is the game where NC State beat Houston in the final. Obviously, that's heartbreaking for some of the older fans, but that's 41 years ago, and it's been kind of the folklore of college basketball ever since, right? It's been a March Madness story as old as March Madness, it feels like, right? And needless to say, some of the wolf pack from that era are recognizing that and are actually suing uh, both the NCAA and the uh, university itself for compensation for their name, images, and likenesses. Um, they are, for such so point out that this is 10 people uh, from that team uh, that are still around and sue or their estates are suing uh, for financial compensation for those names, images, and likenesses. Uh, they say that's still used in marketing for the program and the school 41 years later. This obviously took place long enough ago. This was not like considered something you'd have the waivers and things like that for. Like people didn't understand how big the business of college basketball would get in the early 1980s. There was no way. I mean, you were talking about NBA finals games just coming off of tape delay. You were talking about like magic and bird in 79 had a very small TV audience actually, because frankly it was just something that wasn't that big on television at the time. And so the fact that this was as big a thing as it was to the nation, not just Houston and North Carolina ends up being a big deal. Right. Uh, They actually argue in the case, it looks like that they think of that moment that they were a part of as being a big part of the growth of the March Madness branding. Right. Uh, And the case, the documents go on to say that for more than 40 years, the NCAA and its co conspirators have systematically and intentionally misappropriated the cardiac packs publicity rights, including their name, images, and likenesses associated with that game. And that play reaping scores of millions of dollars from the cardiac packs, legendary victory. The lawsuit said the big point of this is actually later. The suit contends that quote student athletes value to the NCAA does not end with their graduation archival footage and other products constitute an ongoing income stream for the NCAA long after the students whose images are used have moved on from college. That's that's a big deal. And here's why that's a big deal. If that gets found to be true in the court of law, right, or if a settlement ends up leaning into, like, okay, that's probably fair game. What's to say Phi Slamma Jamma isn't next, right? Legitimately the exact same era 
What's to say the game of the century? Lou Alcindor of Alvin Hayes. What's to say that isn't next? This, this idea that college basketball history needs to be retroactively compensated as if, frankly, they were able to get paid the whole time because we're still using the images, the stories. I mean, it, history is storytelling, right? That's a big deal. And it's a big deal to North Carolina State and the 10 players that are suing for them from that team. Obviously, what's well, a big deal to programs like Houston that are intricately tied to the history and growth of the game. You cannot talk about the history of college basketball and not mention the University of Houston, we'll say in several chapters of the book, right? Uh, several different eras, several of successes, Guy V. Lewis, uh, Fi Slamma Jamma, Elvin Hayes, the integration of the South, all, all, all those kinds of things in college basketball, right? If you're going to say that the people involved in that need to be compensated for their name, image, and likeness because we still use those stories. I don't know if you want to pull the money from Houston, from the NCAA as an institution, from the boosters. I don't know where you want to get it from, but Houston folks are going to need to find it. Right? And Houston still, to this day, whether it's with the different clothing brands, the the homages, the Charlie Hustles, the, the folks that pay homage, uh, homage is one of the brands, actually, to the old Phi Slamma Jamma. I have t-shirts, right? Uh, the Phi Slamma Jamma days, right? Texas Tallest Fraternity. Um, whether it's that, the clips, uh, the, the B-roll as you're leading into a game on television, um, like, like what limit gets put on this? What cap gets put on this? What does this do to those stories? What does this do to using those stories to market this program? Right? I mean, Houston's got a roller coaster of a history in basketball, but those highs are really high. And while we feel like, I mean, we're in one right now, right? Um, you can't you can't get to this point in the roller coaster without the other points in the roller coaster. You don't start the roller coaster in the middle, right? And so, I feel like while this is a painful suit to watch because the game they're going to show over and over again is the '83 national championship game, it's something you've got to keep an eye on because Houston's going to be directly impacted by the outcome. It might not be immediate. It might not be in like the short term, but in a long term view, this lawsuit will hit schools like Houston if it goes certain ways. And I, I, I kind of wonder how it does. I will also point out that theoretically you could throw out stuff from before the nineties and say like, there was no way to know how big college sports would have grown. No one could, would have conceivably done this, that, and the other thing, the way they did da, 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 Right. But stuff much more recent than that, you you do you do have an idea of how big college sports are going to go. So, like, and this is jumping to football, but what happens to the Case Keenum storytelling, the Peach Bowl? What happens in the twenty twenty one Final Four run? At at what point does that window open or close, where you do have to compensate? people for their name image and likenesses even after the fact or even if they played before those rules are in place this lawsuit's going to tell us a lot about how legally that goes legally not what you think now what i think what a court of law decides right and kind of regardless of what you or i think that's going to be how people decide to get paid on this and i think it's a big deal and I know I pay attention to the business and the dollars and cents of this and sometimes, and that kind of has a very specific audience within the community here. And you're probably tired of me rambling about it. You want me to get to more basketball kind of things that like we will in a second. But I feel like you got to keep an eye on this one, not just because of the highlight they're going to show over and over again. And I don't know that it's getting the national attention that it should. So I mean, keeping a close eye to something that frankly is not getting a whole lot of national pub. Now, with that said, 
Um, I do want to talk about the present tense and I guess really more future tense of the basketball team, not just the past. But we're talking about employment and getting paid. If you have a small business and you're hiring for it and you get professionals like Vice Lama Jamma, I mean, they weren't quite professional at the time, but you feel me, right? You've got to find the best quality candidates for your roles, right? That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools you need to find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who are not actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role in a given month. Over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're simply looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, in the future tense, instead of looking at the past and getting upset about things, in the future tense, in uh, terms of the Houston Cougar men's basketball program, they had a massive, massive recruit on campus last weekend, both in the literal and figurative sense. Koa Pete. Koa is a 6'8", 210-pound combo forward from Arizona, the state of Arizona. And he was on campus last weekend visiting the University of Houston. He is a top five consensus recruit in the class of 2025. He is ranked as high as three. He is ranked no lower than eighth. He is consensus, or sorry, no lower than five. Um, my three here on my thing is bad eyes. Worry about that. Getting older, I guess, over here. Huh? Cole Pete, top five consensus 2025. As high as three, no lower than five. And I have to, have to, have to, have to say, when he walks on the basketball court, he does not look like he's playing, he should be playing in the same division as those around him. And they used to look at the goes around and realize, oh, this is the highest levels of high school basketball, both at the prep level and and the AAU level. He's playing with Compton Magic, the top-ranked Adidas team out of the state of California, and he is also playing at the uh, national circuit the uh, for high schoolers um, in the in the academies. And I just, hmm, he's impressive physically. 6'8", 210, well-built muscular kid. Um, and the kind of kid, and I say this, I'm going to explain how it's not, he is not the same kid, but reminds you of the way Jairus Walker walks into a room as a high schooler or a freshman. Like, oh, that guy is physically ready to play right now, right? Now, he is not the explosive athlete that Jairus was. I don't mean to, to put that burden on him. That's not fair. Frankly, very few people at that size are. But he is the same kind of strong between his shoulders. He's got long arms. He uses his size incredibly well, and he's a giant perimeter player. And I think that's why it sticks out as somewhat the same. He's a perimeter forward like Jarris was with that kind of strength, right? That's really, really hard to find at the high school level. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what he does for jumping into what I think is interesting about the 2025 class. Um offensively he uses that strength really well around the rim goes through contact absorbs contact finishes anyway incredibly soft touch for a guy that big uh i would say inside of about eight or nine feet his touch is like top tier next level nba ready kind of touch uh shoots ball really well off the bounce i mean it's like dribbling uh, mid-range and threes pull up off the bounce pretty well for a six eight kid um Obviously, the three is going to get better with time. He's not a finished product, um, but I would say for a high school case, shoots the ball really well off the bounce. And he has the size to go up on dunk on top of people, and maybe with some time and the power cleans and the squats and the plyometrics with Coach Bishop uh, and the strength program, he'll get to that. Uh, but right now, he's more content with going through contact, frankly, 
knocking people down with like the contact, even not in an offensive foul kind of way. I mean, more like people think they're going to go and try and block his shot and they just get demolished and then finishes while he's still in the air and you're on the way to the ground, if not already on the ground. Right. Um, another offensive skill set I think he has actually starts in the defensive end. And he's the kind of forward that can take the ball off the rim for a rebound and push the ball and become the fast break himself. Doesn't need an outlet pass. Right. My note here says doesn't need an outlet pass. Right. Like he is that kind of fluid with the ball, reads the break really well, reads the break really well. And I think we see more. It's, Moments where it feels like he might be almost flashy, too flashy. Um, he really enjoys, a appears to enjoy, I shouldn't speak for him. He appears to enjoy a good fast break assist, right? He'll drive the lane and get the defense in the air with him and drop the ball for the big. He'll flip around the back pass and transition. He'll do different things that put a little extra sauce on it um, in the fast break that clearly indicate, A, he's got Garrett command of the ball, but B, he also is having a good time while doing it. On defense, use the length well, um, uses all, every inch of that frame, gets really, really big in the post, hands really, really high and extended. Um, I thought when covering big people, like forwards and centers, he did a really good job in the pick and roll of switching and playing perimeter defense for a guy his size. He's kind of a daunting figure out there on the perimeter he does that. Very, very active on the glass. I thought he was a better off ball and switch defender than on ball post defender. And I think that's deceptive because we think, okay, 6'8, 210, built like a truck, right? Like he's going to be good in the post defensively. He actually, I think, is better in the post as coming up as a help side guy. Uh, not again. I can continue to compare him to Jairus. Um, but the same way we saw Jairus get a lot of help side blocks, right? He comes off the backside and two-step gallop. Done the same kind of vertical that Jairus did, but it has a great timing. Um, so I was really impressed with him, to say the least. He is one of... There's a consensus top 10 in the 2025 class as of the recording of this episode. Um, that means that they're all in some sort of order across the major outlets doing recruiting, right? Of that consensus top 10... Five have Houston offers, including Koa. Uh, Bryson Tiller is a forward from Overtime Elite. He is uh, from Atlanta originally. Isaiah Hartwell, uh, Harwell, not no T, Harwell, is originally from Idaho. He's a 6'5 guard playing at Wasatch Academy. Uh, we talked about this guy before, Darius Acuff. Uh, 6'2 point guard, originally from Detroit, plays at IMG, which is where he played with Chase McCarty, who's on campus in a Cougar now. Right, and then uh, the number one kid consensus across all the recruit sizes: to AJ Debonsta, Debonsta, uh, anyway, AJ Debonsta. He is six eight, fluid forward from Massachusetts at Utah Prep. Now, what's fascinating is of those top five. If you're Instagram stalking, like I decided to do to do some research for this, it appears that they've only the five of them those five guys in the top 10 that have a Houston offer, only three have posted the pictures of them from that visit as an Instagram post. I don't know what value you put on that, but as someone who works with high school kids, that's a big deal, right? And of those, DeBonsta posted a picture, a set of pictures of him in Auburn jerseys at Auburn, right? The same like, what do you think? War Eagle or whatever, the same classic comments, right? Uh, Isaiah Harwell, came in and did his visit at Houston in March, posted pictures from that. Koa Pete visited over the weekend and posted pictures from that. Acuff has posted no pictures of visits. Tiller posted no, posted no pictures of visits. Could they be next? I don't, maybe I'm drawing too much there. I think it feels safe to say that Houston's got a real shot to get one or two of the guys in the top five in the 2025 class. And I know this feels early. We aren't even quite to the end of the EYBL season yet. Uh, guys are not committing uh, in the near few. I mean, we got a couple months to that in basketball senses. They're at team camps and stuff like that right now. They're high school teams before going back on the a AAU circuit. Um, man, man, oh man. I feel like I can fairly confidently say, Houston's got a real good shot to get 
one or more of these top 10 kind of guys in the same class. And we talk about Houston building its way into a blue blood from the ground up in this uh, Calvin Sampson era, but there would be no bigger indication if they not only got multiple top 10 kids in one class, but none of them are from Houston. This is no longer a local program, but a national power. And I think I'm trying to temper my excitement. I'm trying to talk myself down here. I'm not getting all of that. I think that's also a big, 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 big deal. Now, I want to talk some about what Canvas could like look like with these kinds of freshmen on it and kind of dispel a rumor or a myth that I, I kind of felt like wasn't true for a long time, but now I really don't feel like it's true in a second. But first, we're talking about a team, building a team that can win a lot. And if you want to win a lot, you've got to go to FanDuel.com to do it because it's winner-take-all time in both the NBA and NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bets, $150 bucks to bet on point spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right. So I'm talking about big time recruits coming in, in the future. And I really, really think that you're going to see one or more in the 2025 class to pair with Mercy and Chase, who are both great, great as the 2024 class, to pair with or add in a couple with with JoJo Tugler, Jacob McFarland, got great, great 2023 class, uh, really stringing together some real solid wins here several years in a row. And I feel like a lot of people are or they think of Houston as a program that freshmen don't come in and play right away at. And understandable, Kelvin is very open about how hard it is to play the style of basketball Houston plays, especially with the attention to detail on defense as a true freshman, right? Coming in from high schools and, you know, peach jams or back in my day would have been Kingwood or whatever, right? Like coming in from the big tournaments and stuff like that, the highest levels of high school basketball and jumping into a Kelvin Sampson system is not easy. But I feel like people hear how difficult that is and assume that they're never, they're not going to see these studs that are coming in as Houston continues to get better and better basketball players in. They assume they're never going to see them play, and I just they're not going to see them play as freshmen for sure. And I just want to stress, I don't think that's actually true, fair, or accurate. I went back to uh, and looked at the 2019-20 school year. Because that was when a young true freshman walked on campus named Marcus Sasser. And that team was really good. Obviously, the NCAA tournament got canceled. I think it's fair to say they done pretty well in that. However, true freshman Marcus Sasser in that season, you know, a three star kid was not the highly touted everything, but we know turned into Marcus Sasser, or I guess the nation learned about Marcus Sasser anyway, um, came in and played 23.8 minutes for a top 20 team uh, and started over half of the games as a true freshman. Okay. Um, now Marcus is Marcus. He ended up being a first round pick, but he was a high end three star coming in. Right. His his story is one of development and growth and hard work and proving people wrong. Right. And he came in and played a lot as a true freshman. 2021, the final four year. On top of having Quentin Grimes and Ladiki and the whole group, right? You had a kid named Tremont Mark came in as a true freshman from nearby Dickinson High School. Played 
didn't co- didn't start a whole bunch of games or anything like that, but played over 20 minutes per game on a Final Four caliber team in 2021. Over 20 minutes. That's half the game for a Final Four team. Admittedly, 2022, the trend stops a little bit. Roman Walker comes in, plays mostly after other guys get hurt. 2022 is a year of a ton of injuries. The better example for that would be that sophomore Jamal Shedd kind of became the Jamal Shedd, the early stages of that Jamal Shedd. Uh, the backcourt was really mostly Jamal and Kyler Edwards that year, right? So Ramon played an impactful role late, but truthfully that was after injuries. I don't want to use his minutes as a ways to prove my point when it's very obvious. Like he guys got hurt. Now Ramon was important in that team being an elite eight team, right? I, I, in, in, in very, very instrumental in that. But he, he also plays his guy get hurt. So it, it it might hurt the point a little bit. So let's go to 2023, where you have Jairus Walker starting all but one game the entire season. Plays 27 and a half minutes per game. Goes as a lottery pick. The under-discussed thing about freshmen in that same class, Emmanuel Sharp was the first guard off the bench as well as a freshman. Admittedly, he got to campus the year before at Christmas as, mid-year tra- as a mid-year uh, signee. However, he was coming off that gigantic, catastrophic lower leg injury um, and was really just on campus rehabbing. He didn't play in a game in what would have been his senior year of high school, right? So um, I, I think it's fair to call him a true freshman in, in a basketball sense. And he was the first guard off the bench. He was not the sixth man. That was obviously Reggie Chaney. Obviously, rest in peace, Reggie Chaney. Um, he was the sixth man in a lot of different ways culturally as well as a guy that like you had to have on the floor and playing a few minutes every game just to kind of make sure guys are to what we valued. Um, but in terms of minutes, Sharp actually played the six most minutes on the team that year. Right. And he was the first guard off and, and he was important in a lot of big wins, frankly. Um, that's 2023 last year, 2024 before his own injury, uh, Jojo Tugley had worked his way into a gigantic role on a number one team in the country during Big 12 play. You could also talk about his injury as being one of the key negative impacts on the season, right? Tugler was a high talent recruit from the Houston area and came in and played right away as a freshman. Now, said Lott played some too after guys got hurt. But honestly, when you look at the impact of Jojo as a true freshman, it's hard to say freshmen don't play a lot. When you look at Jarris, Emmanuel, Tremon, Marcus, how can you look at this program and say freshmen that are good enough, high in recruits, can't expect to play? So when I talk about the impact that Mercy Miller could have next year or that Chase McCarty will have next year, I don't need people arguing that freshmen don't play. Freshmen, freshmen get to play. Freshmen play when they're good enough. And it's a credit to Samson, both Samsons, and the Quantist, Casey, the whole staff, they find specific kids. Not everyone can play at Houston, but anyone who can will, regardless of age. And I don't think it served the program to have this false narrative out there that in 2024, 25, next year, you won't see Chase or Mercy if they're ready because they're freshmen. That you won't see Koa or John Clark, Shelton Henderson, Sebastian Williams, Adams, Darius, whoever you're looking at in the class of 2025 for the 2025-26 year, that you won't see them if they're good enough. That's disingenuous. They find guys that are good enough, and they play, and they make an impact, and we're finding better and better kids every year. And it's an incredibly well-put-together program. And, And I... I almost worry if this notion, freshmen don't play there, that's hard to play for. I almost worry that that lie hurts Houston. And so I did a little diving. I don't think it's true. If you think I'm crazy, tell me in the comments down below. I think it's really a testament to, again, the recruiting and coaching staff that they do. Um, Maybe I'm crazy. I've been crazy about worse things. So, you know. Uh, Again, tell me in the comments down below. Find me on... uh, 
social media. I was about to say Twitter. I guess they call it X now. Painsworth five one two P A I N S W O R T H five one two on all of your social media platforms. Again, for us your first listen of the day here, Locked On Cougs. Locked On Cougs, the proud member of the Locked On Podcast Network, is your team every day. Go Cougs. <laughs>